Okay, so moving forward today, I'm going to say lecture number five. We're in chapter two. Chapter two deals with functional groups. Um, intermolecular forces and then it ends with um, acids and bases and we have a pogol this week um, 3a in our pogol book and it starts on page 24 of the pogol book so we've already talked about functional groups so I will just briefly state that we um, have talked about this and I said you need to start learning your functional groups because it helps when you're writing your Lewis structures. And I recommend you either download some kind of functional group app or uh, maybe make index cards and you have compounds uh, without a carbonyl and then you have compounds with a carbonyl. And we talked about the without carbonyls are stuff like the aromatic. We talked about alkanes. We talked about alkenes. We've talked about alkynes. So that are the that's the hydrocarbons. And then we talked about if you have a heteroatom. So this is no heteroatom. And the heteroatoms are nitrogen or oxygen. You can also have sulfur in a lot of your amino acids. But for your functional groups initially, for organic one, um, let's just really focus on the nitrogen and oxygen. So if you have the oxygen containing if the oxygen and oxygen likes two bonds with two lone pairs, that would be an alcohol. And or the oxygen can be connected to another carbon. Sometimes you might see in your book ROH or ROR prime. And R's are just these alkyl long chain um, organic compounds. This is an ether. So we have alcohols. So alcohol, and we have an alcohol, and then we also have the ether. Now we uh, for the nitrogen with no um, carbonyl, you can have an amine, and that's an NH2, or you can have a nitrogen with another carbon that's still an amine okay so those are amines and so that takes care of your compounds that are without a carbonyl group the ones with a carbonyl group and no other um, heteroatom we're talking nitrogen or oxygen here you can have a ketone, and that ketone could, that carbonyl could be wherever, but you're on both sides of that carbonyl, you have carbon. That makes it a ketone. If you have it at the end, where one side you have carbon, and this can go forever, and the other side you have a hydrogen attached, that's an aldehyde. Okay, so ketone and aldehyde, where we have five of these, um, just like we have one, two, three, four, hmm. I guess that's all. Um, okay, so then we could also have uh, the carbonyl connected to the nitrogen. That was an amide. You could have the carbonyl connected to a carboxylic acid or an OH. That's a carboxylic acid. Acid. Or instead of this um, hydrogen here, you can put it next to another carbon. 
and this is an ester. Okay, because that oxygen is connected to two things, and it's connected to the carbonyl, and then it's also connected to the R group. And so that would be an ester. That's one, two, three, four, five different compounds. Um, if I look in your book, it talks about these different functional groups. But let's uh, take this functional group on into intermolecular forces. So intermolecular forces are the forces between two molecules. Okay, so inter molecular forces are the forces between um, molecules. You think of the interstate. An interstate goes from one state to the next state. So, um, different functional groups have different types of intermolecular forces. And so the intermolecular forces will determine a lot of your physical properties. And when we think about physical properties, the ones that come to mind first are melting points, boiling points, um, and solubility. A melting point is going from what? Going from a solid to a liquid. And going from a liquid to a gas is the boiling point. And so in a solid, you have a lot of molecules that are really close together. But if you increase your temperature, the heat in, you increase your kinetic energy, and what happens, these molecules start spreading out in the container. And then they go to a liquid, but they're still the same molecule. And then the gas, they get even further apart. And so what determines the temperature of a melting point or boiling point are how closely interacted these molecules, those forces that hold them together, okay? So those are the intermolecular forces. And so ionic forces are the hardest to break apart, okay? They're going to require the most energy to separate. And so you can look at like sodium chloride, that's salt, and it separates into Cl minus and sodium plus. And these are um, ionic forces. They're also called electrostatic forces. And we're not really dealing with that in organic chemistry. This is really organic chemistry, okay? But these are going to have the highest melting points and boiling points. And look those up. Actually, go and look those up and see what those forces are. Now, what you are going to deal with, so this is the highest, and let's rank these, highest. And then we're going to rank the lowest here to separate. So the next one would be, so this is the highest. And we're not really dealing with that with organic compounds. Organic molecules are the carbon container molecules. Um, the highest are would be hydrogen bonding. Okay, and so for something to be a hydrogen bonding, it has to have a hydrogen attached to its header atom. And the header atom has to be either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. And so your biggest players here will be nitrogen or oxygen. And which ones would those be? Okay, well, you got molecules such as carboxylic acids, carboxylic acids, amides, okay, 
they're going to be the highest, number one. Carboxylic acids are two. And then you have um, amines, alcohols, and amines. Okay, three and four. So if they're similar, and you can look these up. So this is an amide. This is a carboxylic acid. This is an alcohol. This is an amine. Now, um, why would the alcohol have a higher melting point than the amine? Well, which one's more electronegative? Oxygen is more electronegative than the nitrogen. And so it's OH and hydrogen bond would be stronger. So this, this is your hydrogen bonding, okay? That would be stronger because it's more electronegative than nitrogen. Um, Carboxylic acids, they can form dimers, okay? So they can turn upside down, and then you get something like this where you can form a hydrogen bond with that lone pair and a hydrogen bond right there, and so that forms a dimer. And so they typically have higher um, attractive forces intermolecular forces to break than um, the carboxylic acid or than the other hydrogen bonders. Okay, so you can see this in your um, book, um, pages uh, 96 and 97, pages 96, 97, 98. Okay, so we have two forces. We've talked about ionic forces. We've talked about hydrogen bonding. We need to talk about dipole-dipole. And then number four, the lowest, are the van der Waals. These are also AKA, also known as London forces. Okay, now London forces or van der Waals are the lowest, and, and these are also called dispersion. And so these are your hydrocarbons. So you know your hydrocarbons. You got the aromatic, you got your alkane, you got your alkene, and you got your alkyne. Those are your hydrocarbons. The key is they have no heteroatom. They have no heteroatom, no nitrogen or oxygen. No nitrogen or oxygen. Then they don't have a dipole dipole, okay? They, because remember we talked about the carbon and the hydrogen essentially being um, a dipole moment of zero D to buy. Okay, so they don't have any dipole-dipole interaction. So these are going to be your lowest. And so um, you can see that um, um, these will be the easiest, the lowest melting points and boiling points. Uh, let's talk about dipole-dipole. These are going to be um, ones that have carbonyls. So you got ketone um, or an aldehyde. So if you can go in here and put a dipole moment, delta positive and delta minus, then you have a dipole dipole. Okay. And so here an aldehyde has a dipole moment. So what does that look like? Well, when these compounds get around each other, such as acetone, then they will organize themselves such that the delta positive carbon will form an attraction with the lone pair of the oxygen. And that's um, the dipole-dipole interaction. And that is um, an electronic force or separation that requires energy. Um, so a lot of times you'll have to rank such compounds. So let's do something like, let's rank the difference. If you had to rank, 
difference between this molecule, this molecule, um, and this molecule. Eh. Okay. Um, so which one would have the highest? Well, the alcohol would have the highest. And we're talking about boiling points here. Um, if the melting points increase, the boiling points increase. And it's because we have um, hydrogen bonding here. This, is a, this participates in hydrogen bonding. If something participates in hydrogen bonding, it also has a dipole-dipole, which, as you know, this is a delta positive and this is a delta minus. And it also has van der Waals. So all of these carbon, carbon, carbon bonds have van der Waals. But the dominant force is the hydrogen bonding. Here, this has a very weak dipole, dipole. What is this? This is an ether. Okay, it doesn't have the hydrogen bonded to the oxygen like the alcohol. And so this does a dipole, dipole. This is slightly negative and that's slightly positive. This one here, there's no header atom. And so this just does dispersion or London forces. And this would be your lowest boiling point. And so you will have to rank different boiling points. And you should be able to do that based on functional group. Now, if you're just dealing with um, compounds that have the same functional group, okay? So if you're dealing with compounds with the same functional group and you have to rank them, um, if you increase the number of carbon, then you're going to increase the melting point or the boiling point. Um, the other topic in this chapter with intermolecular forces and physical properties include solubility. Okay, so solubility is how the compound will interact with the solvent. So the solvent is the larger um, amount of um, molecules. So a lot of times you decide whether your compound is going to be soluble in carbon tetrachloride or water. Okay, and so the rule is here is like dissolves like. So carbon tetrachloride, if you draw the Lewis structure, and the Lewis structure would show that this is a tetrahedral, so it's sp3, and you got one chlorine coming at you and one going back, and you'll see that this pulls in equal direction because it's symmetrical, so it has an overall dipole moment of zero to buy, so this is London forces dispersion forces, van der Waal forces. Water, water looks like this. We know that water does what? Hydrogen bonds, okay? So you got a hydrogen bond or you have a very polar. This is very nonpolar. Nonpolar means um, we can also lipophilic, hydro, Phobic, these are all terms to determine solubility. Polar, um, they're also hydrophilic, which is water loving. Okay, so your polar molecules, like dissolves like. So, what compounds? Um, ether for all your hexanes, um, alkanes, your heteroatoms are going to be soluble in here. Um, even ether will probably be soluble in the more nonpolar group. Okay, it's kind of kind of be a little bit over here on the nonpolar. It's considered nonpolar. Um, your carboxylic acids will be water soluble. Amides tend to be water soluble. Um, the dipole dipole for like ketones, um, the lower and aldehydes, uh, it depends on the lower number of carbons. I think your rule of thumb when you read is about number four. And so then after that, then it becomes more um, polar. But you can choose other solvents, but you just figure out 
what kind of um, intermolecular forces does that solvent interact with? And then remember, like dissolves like, and you can figure out which kind of functional groups and compounds would be soluble in the different solvent. Okay, so the last thing we are going to work on is um, acid-base chemistry. And acid-base chemistry is important. Um, and acid-base chemistry, you've probably talked about in gen chem. Um, we'll kind of briefly talk about the definitions, okay, in your book, page 104, talk about acids and bases. And we have Bronsted, Lowry, acids and bases. And this was basically an English chemist named Thomas Lowry. And, um, and then there was Bronsted, which is a Danish chemist. And they said an acid, a Bronsted acid donates a um, proton and bases accept a proton and this was a little bit different than the um, Arrhenius definition okay so this came first and this one was always about water Okay, this is all about water. You put a, a compound in the water. If it generates hydroxide, then it's a base. If you put it in water and it generates H3O+, plus, it's an acid. But most of our organic ones are going to be dealing with the Bronsted-Lowry, and you're also going to deal with um, Lewis acids and bases. So we're going to really focus on these because we're in organic chemistry, and I'm trying to give you the tools that you need to do some problem solving. So um, when we focus on some of these reactions, you can see that if you take something you know, like HCl, you know this is an acid, and you react this with sodium hydroxide, you know this is a base. Okay, we know that the acid will donate the proton. Okay, so H plus and it will donate the proton. So let's just figure out what's in the solution here. H plus Cl minus Na plus OH minus. Okay. And so the H plus gets donated. The OH come together to make water. And then you have sodium chloride. Um, this is a neutralization reaction. It does go one way. Now, um, these are all your strong acids with strong bases. Now, what if you have something like H2O plus NH3? Okay, this is ammonia. And this is a weak base. And this is water. And in this case, water sometimes can be an acid or a base, depending on... Um, what it's with. So here, the nitrogen, the base, will accept the hydrogen and become NH4. Let's draw the Lewis structure here, NH4. And then the OH, and it becomes OH minus. Okay, so this is your ammonium hydroxide. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at the pKa's, and you will need to get a pKa sheet, um, page 107 in your textbook, and then you can look at your slide. I would print off a pKa chart, and I would start learning pKa values and learning how to use the pKa. You're also going to have to look at factors in your POGL 3B, so you understand how to predict acids and bases, strength of acids without a pKa value. But let me show you how you do a pKa. So pKa, this is all I need you to know, is 
the negative log of the Ka. And the Ka is products over reactants. Okay, so that's in the definitions that you learned in Gen Chem. Okay, so it's equilibrium constant. So we're talking about weak acids and bases. We're looking at equilibrium arrows here, folks. Okay, so pKa is a measure of the strength, the relative strength of the acid. How well is it going to give up a proton? Okay, so is it going to, when you put water and ammonia in a flask, is it going to stay over here on the reactant side? Or is it going to stay over here on the product side? What do you have in your flask? And the pKa can help you decide that. So you sign pKa, what's the A? The A is for acid, okay? So you sign pKa values to acids and conjugate acids, okay? Because anything that has the H+, plus, so over here, this is the H that's being donated. So that's a weak acid. pKa of water, 15.7. I would say memorize that. Okay, the pKa, where did the H go? It went on to the ammonia. So ammonium, the pKa is what? So look at your chart. And you look at ammonia here. And ammonia has a pKa of... 36, but that's to take away the proton. Do you see that on page 107? But if you look at the ammonium ion, its pK is 9. So pK is 9. So this is the rule. The equilibrium always lies to the side of the reaction with the weakest acid or the higher the pKa value. The higher the pKa value, the weaker the acid. So along with your strong acids, if you look at your pKa table, HCl is negative 7. Hydronium, HF, it's a positive 3. Carboxylic acids, formic acids is 4. So all your organic acids, they're called carboxylic acids, so these are acids of organic chemistry, are between 4 and 5 pKa values. Okay? So the lower the pKa value, the stronger the acid. So the higher the pKa value, the weaker the acid. And your equilibrium goes towards the weaker. So this would go here. So you would show your equilibrium arrows pointing more towards the reactant side. And what's the difference between 9 and 16? What's 16 minus 9? 7. So is the difference 7? You have $7 in your account. 7. Or is it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7? Okay. Or is it um, 10? The 10 billion, so see, it's it's seven zeros. So these are logs, not seven dollars, but 10 billion. Okay, so 10 billion is bigger than seven dollars. So it, those are real numbers. 10 billion. It's 10 billion times um, the ammonium hydroxide product is 10 billion times stronger than the water, and that's how you uh, use pK values. So at this point, I want to go to your 3A and work your Pogel activity on acids and bases. Okay, so let's work model one and answer the questions on page 24. So we're doing model one acid-base definitions. So you have an acid, a base, and we have Bronsted, Lowry, and we have Lewis. And these are the ones we really care about with organic chemistry. Acids donate a proton, and Lewis acids 
except except electron pair. That's the definition. This is an acid. The bases, they will accept a proton or they will donate electron pair. And then you have this reaction here. HA plus water equilibrium value arrows H3O plus plus A minus. Okay, question number 1A. In the Bronsted-Lowry definition, what are the roles of the acid and a base? Okay, so you would write the acid donates a proton and the base accepts a proton. What about 1B? Using Brunstead-Lowry definition, which reagent in the reaction in Model 1 acts as an acid? HA or H2O? Okay, well HA donated the proton. So HA would be your Brunstead-Lowry acid, which acts as a base. Well, H2O became H3O plus, so it accepted a proton. So H2O would be your base for Bronsted-Lowry. Okay, what about 2A? In the Lewis definition, what are the roles of an acid and a base? One acid accepts an electron pair, a base donates an electron pair. Using the Lewis definition, which reagent in the reaction of model one acts as the acid, HA or H2O. Okay, now we gotta look at our electron pairs. This is where it's nice to draw in HA. You can think of A as a halogen plus water. Okay, and what happens is these electron pairs went and took the hydrogen and became H3O plus plus A minus. You see this, this is called electron flow arrows. You saw it in the um, resonance structures and you also see it in reaction mechanisms. This is really your first reaction mechanism and it's acid-base chemistry. So the electrons are going to go and form a new bond and now they're forming a new bond between this proton, okay? In doing so, these electrons here go with the A. And then we do the formal charges. So, what was 2A? 2B. Using the Lewis definition, which is what you're going to pretty much do in all of organic chemistry, which reagent in the reaction acts as the acid? Well, accepts a lone pair. So, accepts a lone pair. So, H2O accepts the um, electron pair. And which acts as a base? Donates electron pair. So HA donated the electron pair. And H2O accepted the electron pair. So, okay, I want you to be able to do number three. And I won't usually ask you to know the definitions. Okay, I'm just not going to. But number three is important for me. I need you to be able to label. You will see this, especially if you look at any of my old quizzes and stuff like that. So I need you to be able to label acid, base, 
conjugate acid, conjugate base, okay? Um, so this is an acid, and the way I do it is I find where it, what proton. Where's the proton? It's going to be moved, okay? So that's your acid. And then where did it go? It went over here, okay? So that's your conjugate acid. And those are what you're going to be able to sign pKa values to. So then that makes this a base. So on the reactant side, you're always labeling acid and base. And on the product side, you label conjugate acid, conjugate base. And that makes this your conjugate base. So you will have to label that. And you will need to show your electron flow arrows. You'll have to draw out your Lewis structures and show this electron flow movement. Okay, question number four. Um, and by the way, when the best definition for this one, just so you know, it really is um, the Bronsted-Lowry. So whenever you look for the proton that's being donated and accepted, and you can label acid and base. And then you can also put pK values. Uh, question number four is when you really apply the Lewis. Okay, you really don't apply the Lewis um, acid base definition to compounds that, that are donated in the proton. Um, you do it to, this is actually called a Lewis acid. Okay, your Lewis acids are like BF3, aluminum trichloride, and you'll, you'll need to know some Lewis acids in organic too. Uh, what do they have in common? What is the hybridization of aluminum? Here it's sp2. Okay, so that means the geometry is planar and every one of these angles is 120 degrees. But this also means that there's an unhybridized p orbital that's above and below that plane. Okay, and so when you come in here with something like chlorine, chlorine can donate its electron pairs into this unhybridized orbital. And then it forms a bond. So over here, you're forming aluminum, Cl, 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 Cl. And then you do your formal charge. So what's your formal charge? Because you want to draw your correct Lewis structures. Aluminum, formal charge, group number three, group number minus dashes, minus dots. So it's got four dashes and zero dots. That's a negative one. So that's a negative one. And then here's your chlorine. It's um, not... Um, in its normal bonding pattern, group 7 minus dashes 2 minus dots 4, 7 minus 2, 5 minus 4, the plus 1. Okay, so that's your overall, that's your overall neutral. Um, and that is your reaction there. And this is your best definition here. So there's your Lewis acid. This would be your Lewis base. And it's donating a pair of electrons and it's forming a new covalent bond. And you really want to use Bronsted-Lowry and pKa values for when you have a proton. Okay, so now we're going on to model two. So model two is page 25. Um, this is your acid dissociation constant. So this is your Ka value and your pKa. The equilibrium constant is the concentration of products over the concentration of reactants. Since the concentration of water is a constant, in acid-base reaction, the equations can be arranged so the acid dissociation constant looks like the following. So 
where you have your H3O plus and your A minus over HA. And so they're also saying the pKa equals the negative log of your Ka. So now you have questions like number five. Um, and the equilibrium constant label the products and the reactants. Um, okay, so it is, these are your products. So let's write the reaction HA um, HA plus water goes to H3O plus plus A minus. So you can see that these are the products and we leave out water, okay? And so this is the reactants. So products over reactants. If Ka is large, the concentration of products would be larger. If Ka is large, the concentration is of acid is strong. Okay. Consider the definition of pKa. Okay. Um, in model two, if Ka is large, the pKa of so Ka is large, the pKa is small. Uh, if Ka is small, then the pKa is large. A small pKa means that the acid is, so a small pKa means that the acid is strong. And you can just look at the chart. HCl has a negative 7 pKa value. Your strongest acids have acid, uh, pKa values negative, less than 0. Um, a large pKa value means that the um, base would be strong. Now, so number six, of the following pKa values, circle one that corresponds to the strongest acid and draw a box around the one that cor corresponds to the strongest base. So negative 10 would be the one you would want to circle. And then a 30 would be a box for the strongest base. Okay, so that's your strongest acid. That's just trying to get you an understanding of pKa values. pKa value is a measurement of the strength of the acid. All right, so now we're on model three. pKa values of common acid base pairs. So we have HA and it goes to H plus plus A minus. And you see that you have these electrons going here. Now you have your different acids and bases. I will just, so HBr the pKa value is negative 9 and the conjugate base you just lose the, the H. That's your conjugate base this is your acid. Okay, HCl is uh, negative 2.2, conjugate base, Cl minus. CH3, this is a carboxylic acid, it's acetic acid, 4.74, so your carboxylic acids are between 4 and 5, and it's this hydrogen that gets taken away. And there's your conjugate base. Water, 15.7, and it becomes hydroxide. Um, ammonia, NH3, with a lone pair, it becomes NH2 minus. That is up there, 33. Ammonia, 
these are amines, right? These are the bases of organic chemistry, okay? Carboxylic acids are your acids of organic chemistry. HBr, HCl, these are called, they don't have, they, they don't have any carbon and they are your inorganic acids. And sodium hydroxide, and that would be an inorganic, inorganic base. These are going to be stronger than your organic. You see your carboxylic acids are around 4.7, your organic base is around 3. CH4, if you lose that hydrogen, you become CH3 minus. This one's up there at 50, okay? So you're not, not going to take an H plus from carbon, okay? You can think of this as money, $50. You gotta pay, you're not gonna do it. It's not energetically favorable. Okay, now you have questions. Question 7A, which atom of acid in model three will accept the pair of electrons? Okay, which one accepts the electron? Well, it's the A. See how the electrons go to the A? That becomes negative, so it's the A. Of the acid listed in model three, which is most likely to accept an electron pair? Okay, so pK value um, tells you the strength. Likely to accept. This wants, this wants, um, Uh, most likely to accept an electron pair. Well, it's this one here. So this is the most likely to accept the electron pair. It's big. Bromine, the bromide, it's very polarizable. It's big. It can be left on its own. It's stable. On own, it's stable. Okay, so it'll take that electron pair. Bring it on over. Okay, so this is most likely. Which acid is least likely? This is not stable. Okay, not stable. Cannot be by its own. It's very reactive. Okay, this one's the least likely to accept an electron pair. Okay, so for 7C, the acid most likely to accept an electron pair is going to be your stronger that's going to be the strongest acid. Of the bases listed in model three, which is most likely to donate an electron pair? Which base is least likely to donate an electron pair? So this, of the bases, of the bases, this is the most likely to donate. Okay, and you're going to learn that like um, magnesium, methyl magnesium, you would make this a positive, you make that a negative, and this is a strong base, okay? One of the strongest bases because of the pKa value of 50, okay? Least likely to donate electron pair. This uh, bromine will not accept a hydrogen, okay? So it's going to stay as a bromide. The base most likely to donate electron pair is the most likely to donate would be your strongest base. All right, so a number eight. A reaction always proceeds from stronger to weaker reagent. Use the pK values to help me answer the questions. Okay, this is an important question because this is what I want you to be able to do with your acid-base reactions. This is your first reaction. You'll get to about 180 reactions by the time you get through organic two. Okay, so this is your first. You have to label this as an acid. You have to recognize that's a carboxylic acid. You recognize this as a base. All right, so using the information in model three, the pKa value of the acidic acid, I think it was 4.74. So 
So I just the carboxylic acids are between four and five, and the pKa of the OH. Um, don't even do that one. Just strike that. Okay. So um, then you want to describe what happens. So this is what I want you to be able to do. I want you to draw in your Lewis structures. So you draw in your lone pairs, and you need to show your electron flow. So the electrons go from there to take the acid, the proton, and then those electrons will go to the oxygen. And then you draw your product here. CH3 And there's your Lewis structure. This would be your conjugate base. Okay, because it lost its electron, the hydrogen. And now the hydrogen is bonded to the OH, and that made water. So this is your conjugate acid. Okay, we only put pK values on these acids. So this conjugate acid, you can look, sign at 15.7. Now your equilibrium arrow, um, equilibrium lies to the highest pKa value, which is your lowest, um, your weakest acid. So which way is it going to go? It's going to go to the products. Okay. Um, what's the difference? What's about 16 minus 5? 11. So that is 11 zeros. Okay, that's how many times it's going to go. All right, so that's what you want to do. Let's look at number nine. Um, you have, and you're basically doing this with each one. This is methanol, it's an alcohol. You want to draw your Lewis structures. And then you have the hydroxide. And you go ahead and draw that Lewis structure out. All right. Now it's telling you, um, it's giving you the products. All right. And that's equation one. And then it's also giving you equation two. So let's. Um, HBr CH3 O H plus plus Br minus equation 2. Um, so you use this um, Weak pKa values greater than 6 can act as either acids or bases depending on what reagent. So pKa values greater than 6. So methanol, its pKa values, alcohols are between 16 and 18. Okay, so its pKa values about 16. Water is the same way. It can act as an acid base. A, using it. Any acid base definition predict whether methanol acts as an acid or base in equation one. Okay, well, it gave up its proton. You see, its proton's here, and then it gave it up. Okay, so in this way, it gave it up the proton, it acted as an acid. And what happened was these electrons came, took the acid, and those electrons were given to the oxygen. All right, so using any acid-base definition, predict whether methanol acts as an acid or base in equation two. Well, here the lone pairs go and take the proton right here from the, brom the bromine, okay? So it accepts the proton here, which makes it a base. Okay, so there it acts as a base. Now label the acid base conjugate acid for each reaction. You need to be able to do this. So this is acid, this is base. Remember on the pro on the reactant side, it's acid or base. This is base, so this is acid. On the pr 
product side, it's always conjugate acid, conjugate base. So wherever the proton went, that's the conjugate acid, and the other would be conjugate base. Here's the proton, conjugate acid, conjugate base. And this is one of those things where you would want to assign pK values to figure out. So the pKa value here of this acid is 16. Over here, pKa is water, 15.7. So which way did it go? It's about equal, isn't it? So those are equal. All right, well, what about the bottom one? pKa of the acid, that's not this one. This is your pKa now of the acid is, what does that thing say? The chart? Negative 9. Negative 9. The pKa of um, hydronium. You can look on page 107 and you see that the hydronium is... I don't see it on here, but it's about 1.7, okay? So 1.7. So which way does it go? It goes towards the higher pKa value. What's the difference there? 9, 10, 11 zeros. Okay, so once your group has reached a consensus, discuss and predict an approximate pKa value for methanol based on the pKa values. So anyway, I just told you it's 16. All right, so we're on our last model, model four, and then you're able to do your additional problems on page 28 and 29. All right, so let's get this last one. All right, so this is model four. And it's about how to draw the curved arrows that we've been drawing. All right. So in order to draw your acid-base reactions, you have to draw your Lewis structures. And this is obviously showing you how to draw resonance structures, right? We've been doing that. That's equation three here, HBr. This is a reaction. Equation four. And then we have this here with water. And this is equation five. All right, consider the resonance structure. So we're talking about equation three. 10a, the resonance structure shown in equation 3, describe what the curved arrow means. Well, the curved arrow goes from here to there. So the curved arrow means the movement of electrons from a pi bond between the carbon and oxygen to a, a non-bonding orbital on the oxygen. And you see how you have this here? Each one of these pointed sides of the arrow represents an electron. There's two electrons here. And then you can see the electrons over here. All right, what about 10B? Consider the dissociation of HBr in equation four. Describe what the character, the, the arrows mean. So here we have the arrows and it has its electrons. Okay. And those, so those electrons here and that sigma bond now go here. So it is the movement of electrons from a sigma hydrogen bromine bond to a non-bonding orbital on bromine. And when it's charged like that, it's bromide. All right, and then we have C, 10C. Consider the acid-base reaction shown in equation five. Describe what the curved arrow shows. Okay, equation five. 
we have our curved arrows. Okay, so it's showing you that these electrons, so it's the movement of the electrons from a non-bonding orbital on oxygen forms a new sigma bond, which is a covalent bond with H plus. And so those electrons now are between that hydrogen and that oxygen. Curved arrows show the movement of what? Circle, either protons, electrons, or atoms. Yes, electrons. Okay, 11. Once the group reached consensus on the above questions, come up with a description of how a curved arrow, where to start and where to end. Okay, um, curved arrows go to the nucleus or the location. And what you're going to learn, we're going to talk about nucleophiles and electrophiles. It always goes from a nucleophile to an electrophile. Okay, so it's where it's going to. Draw curved arrows to show formation of the products from questions 8 and 9. I think we did that earlier. Use of curved arrows is an important tool in showing how organic reactions proceed. Based on your question 11, explain why Lewis acid base definition makes more sense. Um, it's because you're doing the movement of electrons, so a lot of times people like to track the flow of electrons. But however, when we're doing pKa values, you really want to do the um, Bronsted-Lowry definitions. Okay, so it looks like you are ready to go on your reactions, on your questions number 14, 15. Yes, yeah, so and additional problems number 14 and 15 are due for your participation points. Make sure you draw out all the structures and the curved arrows and pK values.